Milk mustache. You guys are so gross. So gross. Doggy. You want to try and do this for real? Yeah, you want to? Let me get set up. This is why you don't have your fucking brother film for you. Is that in focus? Can you guys see that back at home? It's too much comfort. It's what it is. All camera guys aren't this comfortable. My brother's an ass. Testing, testing. One, Testies. two, One, testicles. Two, what are you doing, sports? What are you videoing, Dad? Mm, we're gonna shoot from the cuff like we always do. I don't like that you're that close. All right, dudes and dudettes, so this is what we're gonna do. I got. Dudes and dudettes. Yeah. My dudes and dudettes. Like well, you start it then. Go, dudes and dudettes. Tell them. Ah. Don't get shy now. Say, what's up, dudes and dudettes? I like it. So I got my nieces here. I got the fam here, of course. And then I got my older douchier brother. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna have him film and edit because he's good at it. And that's what he does for a living. So now we're gonna do it here for the YouTube, which frees me up some time to get the rest of this stuff built. Can't really see anything yet because there's nothing to see, but we just cleared out the entire garage. We got some animals moved outside. We got inspections coming next week and the week after that. So we got USDA and FWC coming out. Once we pass all that stuff, then we're gonna be good to go. And most of the stuff is built and we're gonna get into moving piece by piece through the property, explaining why we did the things we did, why we put the enclosures where we put them based on you know husbandry, shade, requirements for certain animals, the sloth especially, but a lot of these animals are gonna be moving to the zoos which brings us to today's episode now we're going to get into the property here moving further along and we're going to try and post as much as we possibly can consistently now that i have some help on the camera side with me it's a little bit difficult i can't sit behind a computer for that long and then on top of that um, it's much easier for eric to do the editing because that's what he does for a living so well, it will take me eight to ten hours to edit it'll probably take him an eight hour to maybe two. yeah probably <laughs> <laughs> Except for he just does it better. So I hope you guys like the new format that we're going to be working with. It's going to evolve over time. So Eric's going to try his little tricks of the trade. And then I'm sure we're going to morph this into something. But we want to try and build a foundation and a good solid channel uh, for the animals and other things too. I want to kind of branch out because I've give, been given a lot of thought to the whole YouTube thing. I've been gone for a long time and then being gone for a long time. It does hurt me in a way, but in a way there's always my core group of people that are always there supporting and I love you guys to death. You guys know who you are, all of you. And my Patreon has been going, but we haven't been doing much. Now we've been gearing up to do more. It's just the way that things have been and everything has been going with the projects that we have going on right now too, which I can't say anything about. I'll tell you guys about it later. Um, but we got big things in the works and we have a lot of work at the house. This is a 24 seven job. It makes it very difficult for me to stop and film consistently, especially when the stuff that we're filming, quite frankly, isn't that interesting. We're building a lot, so it's mainly me out there digging holes, mixing concrete and doing all that stuff. The fun stuff is right here. This is what everybody wants to see. So I will show some of the builds, but it's harder to get those filmed because it does take days on end. So I'd have to film days on end and we have not figured out how to do that yet. I'm sure Eric will have some pointers on that. But these guys, as you guys know, are Maui and Moana's babies. So Maui and Moana, this year they went on April Fool's Day. So mommy had her babies a little bit early, probably because of the winter. Our winter was a little earlier. We had colder nights. And uh, this was the first year, especially up here, that it got as cold as it did. So it'll kind of switch the cycle around a little bit. Remember for these guys, these lemurs in specific, they're nesting animals. And when I say nesting animals, it means that usually like okay so I'll, I'll bring it to something that everybody knows ringtail lemurs those are the ringtail uh, the lemurs that are on uh, Madagascar with the little stripes on their tail 
those guys will carry the babies. So they'll have one to two babies and they will carry those babies. These guys are a little bit different. When I say carry, mom will carry them on the chest, they'll switch to the back and that's how they get around. So mom always has one or two babies on her. So for the ring tails, they can have twins. These guys can have up to six babies. Imagine carrying up to six babies on your back and on your chest constantly. Now mom always has four. That is the most that I've ever seen in any litter of rough lemurs. I'm sure other people have had it before too and I'm sure other people have had possibly more but they got six little nipples that means they can have six little babies if they if they uh if they had that many in their belly they could feed them all but it does get a little bit frustrating for mom as the years have gone by the first year it was very hard to pull those babies mom was kind of looking for the babies by year number four now she gets tired of it after about two weeks we try to push them to about a month before we pull these guys but because i had to go out of country for the other project i pulled these guys a little bit sooner because we don't want them number one bothering mom too much like if you see mom right now her tail's a little scruffy she looks a little disheveled and you would be too if you had four of these little monsters on you not to mention that their teeth are coming in so they're teething so you're going to see them chewing on fingers chewing on little buttons chewing on everything and we allow that to happen for a little while chewing on the kids toes we allow that to happen for a little while because it's a natural behavior just like the kids that we have their teeth are coming through it hurts they're going to try they're not really trying to bite you with, with the teeth that they have coming out they try and work your finger to the back of their mouth right where the new teeth are coming in and they kind of just gummy there because it feels good just like a human baby now the nesting side of it means that mom will put these guys in a corner put them on top she carries them around so she'll literally grab them around the, the back like that with the mouth and pick them up and she'll carry the babies either up to the top down to the bottom wherever she feels most comfortable that day so she will leave those I'm stop eating your microphone. hey <laughs> hey quite on set bud you know how this works so don't eat the microphone you can show everything but the microphone so with these guys here being nesting babies, uh, the mom does have time to herself for a little bit, but she's super attentive. But Mo can you not? Moana's a super good mother. She's very attentive. She's always good with the baby. She's always very gentle. And she always feeds the way that she's supposed to. But feeding four babies takes a lot out of the animals. So we add the multivitamins, which they always take anyway, but we'll up the vitamins for her a little bit when she's having the babies. And then we also, once the babies are pulled, guess what happens? kids cover your ears i don't know if i mean regardless it's it's part of nature she swells up so all her all her uh, uh, you know what i'm saying they swell up and it becomes a little bit painful organs. there you go you could use that so the reproductive organs will swell up um, after we pull the babies because she's not feeding them anymore so we make sure that we give her uh, half of a baby aspirin and we do that for about four days and it relieves the tenderness and the pain and then after that she's good realistically mom is happy now when we pull the baby she gets a little bit tired after two weeks and normally in the wild they're going to start exploring and spreading out with the enclosure that we have they're kind of up mom's butt all the time now we turn into mom and dad so they still know mom and dad mom and dad sit at the hey 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 mom and dad sit at the window often when these guys run by and they'll pay attention to them but for the most part mm, yeah i'm gonna say mom and dad probably really don't care that there's four lemurs running around the inside of the house they're happy with their personal space but what we try and do with these guys which i wish everybody was down here everybody bailed on us as soon as we got here but we have the kids and we have new people come over all the time too and then we have the little squirrely nut dog where's he at hey biggie smalls you guys know me and my ferocious dogs. So I have my Mastiff and Tiny Dog, and they're all put up right now because, not that they're mean with the lemurs, but uh, Pickles doesn't know how big she is, and she tries to sit on everybody. So with Pickles sitting on the lemurs, it's not very conducive to, you know, the lemurs being comfortable so we put them up while these guys are out so it's a constant shift it does get a little bit difficult and a little bit hectic inside the house when you have four monkeys rolling around plus the dogs plus everything else we got going on so it's a magical shift that we're doing on a constant basis but these guys will be leaving they won't be staying on property as much as we want to biggie smalls are you going to be the new protector of the house with those guys hmm Hmm? They're probably so upset that you're in here and, and they can't be with the lemurs. But this guy likes the lemurs. And the other ones like the lemurs too, they just don't know their size. But a good thing for the dog is that it does help us raise animals 
And for anybody that remembers Hurley, if you don't remember Hurley, that was my very first dog and Duke was my second dog. They were raised around a whole lot of babies and a whole lot of different animals all the time. Pickles and Tiny Dog, they got the butt end of it where we kind of had what we had. We were at the park at the time, so there was less things coming into the house. We dealt with more of that at the park. So it's not that they're aggressive towards the animals. They've always seen the animals. They've always been around them. But with Hurley and Duke, those guys slept in the bed with the lemurs. They slept in the bed with monkeys, with the bobcats, the caracals, everything we raised over the long, long years of doing this, the dogs always played a part. And the good part about the dogs is that they do uh, kind of, I mean, these are wild animals. So, and this may be a personal opinion of mine, but based off what I've seen over the years, and a lot of my friends do this too with their big cats. I got a buddy of mine that's got his uh, black jag over there and he's got a little dog for it. So I got another buddy that does his tigers and he usually raises those tigers with a dog, whether it's a small dog, big dog, whatever it is. And the thought behind it is two things. Number one, if you have an animal that's alone, which we never do with the primates anyway, even if I had one little baby lemur, I would make sure that lemur went somewhere with another lemur. So they need the same social capacity that we have they have so they need that social interaction with other animals their species we can't spend 24 hours a day with them the dogs help now not all of the lemurs appreciate the dog as much as this little guy right here or he's i just wanted to talk to you about your car's extended warranty yeah i just wanted to get in there and talk about that so this is the only lemur that seems to allow the dog to really be all over it, but they all play with them. And the thought process behind having a domesticated animal with a wild animal is they will kind of pick up on some of the cues that the little doggy does and, uh, and kind of create a behavior that's a little bit more conducive to what we're trying to do. Obviously, we want these guys well socialized. That's why we allow the neighbors over here, the kids, everything like that, to come over and hang out with the lemurs. The lemurs are out most of the day. Granted, the dogs have to come inside too, so we can't just leave them out all the time. So they do get put up sometimes or they'll go upstairs to the kids room but it's the most amount of time that we could possibly spend so i do have work but thankfully it's summer for the kids so the kids get to play with the lemurs all day long now if the kids came down Michaela and Kyla, and if Brooke came down, all the lemurs would run to them. They're the ones that do the feedings right now. They're the ones that uh, spend the most time with them. So they do get along with everybody, but they do have their personal favorites too. And that's obviously where the food's coming from. That's generally how it works. Now they do get upset because later on in life, the animals tend to turn around and, and, and they tend to and they tend to like daddy a little bit more than everybody else, but that's okay. But um, I think that comes with, I don't know, something I was born with. I don't, I don't mind uh, getting chewed on. I don't mind weird situations that you get put in with animals. And that's the, that's the whole premise behind all of this wildlife is everything is cute and cuddly when it's a baby. And this is a great point for everybody that sees this and goes, I would love to have one of these in my house. There's pros and cons. Number one, you can't just have one. If you just have one, the animal's gonna end up, especially primates, they're gonna end up getting depressed at some point in time. As an animal by itself, you can't spend 24 hours a day with it unless you're retired or you work from home and you can constantly have that monkey with you. Then it's a little bit different. But for all primates, we always have multiples together. Eventually, these guys have to go outside. You see diapers on them now. I don't dress up my monkeys. I know that there's people out there that do. It's not my cup of tea, but we put the diapers on for good reason. There's four of them running around the house, constantly peeing and pooping. Obviously, we're not gonna potty train these guys. They're gonna go outside to a zoo or a wildlife park, and we're very picky and choosy about where they go. But the diapers are on there specifically just so we don't have to find little nuggets of joy all over the place, which is gonna happen. So the diapers go on, but you have to be careful too. These guys can't live, you know, they live a good long time. So you're talking about 20 to 30 years with these guys. And then you're talking about keeping a diaper on it for 20 to 30 years, virtually impossible. Number one, you're changing diapers all the time. Number two, when they get bigger, so does the poop. Number three, it's not necessarily a great thing to have a diaper on for 20 years. Eventually you're going to get rashed up. The hair is going to fall off around the tails. we got to cut little holes in the preemie diapers to get the tails through. It's okay for right now but eventually they're gonna move outside. But the idea here is, <coughs> 
without going in depth about the animals themselves, which I should have said this in the very beginning, these are black and white rough lemurs. They're critically endangered in Madagascar. The way this works in Florida is they cannot cross state lines because it's a critically endangered animals. Uh, these will go to specific zoos and wildlife park, uh, parks that will either display them or they will use them for educational purposes, ambassador animals, all that good stuff. So because we have them now, and I'm still waiting to get my USDA inspection taken care of, I can't do anything with them until I have that piece of paper in hand. A lot of people do. But even with the dogs, if you sell dogs, you're supposed to have USDA. And over, it's overlooked often with the dogs because you see dogs and cats on Craigslist all the time and people have litters and then they sell them, but they're not actively selling dogs. But if you did breed dogs, technically you do need USDA. Anything that's a mammal, and now they're talking about birds too, has to be under USDA. So for me, I can't even go out and try and get these moved yet because I need the piece of paper. So next week when that piece of paper comes in, these will become available. We already know a few people that might take these guys and a few zoos that might want these guys. So what we do in the interim is spend as much time as possible and let them uh, experience life with a bunch of new people all the time. That way when we shift these guys, whether they go together or two at a time, or they go separate to go live with another bloodline of, uh, of lemurs, which is usually how it rolls out because people do want to reproduce because of the critically endangered part and we can only get them in Florida. So we'll spend all the time we can to make sure that these lemurs are very well so uh, socialized. They're used to loud noises. They're used to the dogs. They're used to seeing other animals. They're used to their mom and dad going off on a constant basis. They're used to everything. They're used to kids loud noises they have the hoverboards that they ride around we do all kinds of stuff and it's basically desensitizing these animals so that we can make them to the best of our ability the best animals moving forward just in case somebody wants to use them for ambassador programs not always the case sometimes zoos <coughs> just need them hey no diapers you little butt fart biggie smalls biggie smalls yes mama Bimini might have babies next year, so Bimini and Fiji are outside. Fiji's a little bit young, so she's ready, he's not. She might have them next year, it might be the year after that. And interestingly enough too, what I have found over the last you know, 15 years uh, being around primates is that if you raise, like if I got this one, right, and I got a different bloodline because I wanted to breed them and I got them as little tiny babies and I raise them together and keep them together on a constant basis, most of the time those guys won't reproduce. And I think that the reason for that is that these guys are extremely intelligent, so intelligent in fact that they will mitigate their own inbreeding. So if they're raised as siblings, the chances of reproduction become a lot smaller. Not impossible because the female, when she hits sexual maturity, she's gonna go through heat, that's once a year, unlike our macaques that'll, you know, cycle almost like a human being does. These guys, it's once a year, springtime, they pop out their babies, so when she goes into heat, the male may go after it, he may not. When I get a lemur, like I had Bimini for a couple of years, she's a red, and I put her in with uh, one of Maui and Moana's babies from a couple of years ago, and he's a different bloodline, so what's gonna end up happening is because they weren't raised together and they were put together at an older age, those guys will in fact reproduce. They don't have the sibling love that these guys would have. So if you raise all these guys together, there's three males and a female, chances are the female's not gonna get knocked up, but that's not 100%, so we make sure we split those bloodlines up. But to wrap all this up, and all this fancy information that we're giving you. Essentially, this is just a video to show what goes into keeping stuff like this. And I know a lot of people say that, oh, I'd love to have one as a pet. And I'm not the type of person to tell you, hey, you, you can't have this. I can do this, you can't do this. It's, I'm no different than anybody else. The difference between me and another person is this is what I do for a living. I'm here at the house almost 24 seven unless we're leaving for shows or other jobs, but my job is wildlife. So I'm with these guys all the time. Now, if you're retired and you have the money and the space and the time to do it and you wanna do it properly, anybody in this world uh, can experience what we experience on a certain level. Like if you're talking about 
tigers and things like that, then you need a whole other world of experience. And even with these guys, I would recommend if you ever thought about having one as a pet, to go and spend some time with somebody with a wildlife park, a sanctuary, a zoo, whatever it is, volunteer some time, be around these guys and understand that just because he's cute and cuddly doesn't mean bad things can't happen. That's from Maui two years ago. That's from Maui this year, and I'm sure next year he's gonna keep adding to his whatever he's got going on here. And those are pretty gnarly cuts, and that's from my guy that I raised that slept in my bed for about a year and a half. And he's still a wonderful animal. So is she, Moana's really good too. Now the females is a matriarchal society. Hey, with the coffee, no coffee for you fuckers. You can't do the coffee because then you're going to be running around like little fucking crackheads. Look at and this goes into my point of why it's not exactly all of what you see as far as owning these animals. There is the downside of them fucking up your coffee. So let me go ahead and get this cleaned up. But this is like daily activities with monkeys. And uh, if you want to get one, like I said, I'm not the one to tell you that, you know, I can do it and you can't. But at the same time, everybody should understand that um, it does come at a cost. Like these, I would say it's like having a two-year-old child for about 25 years. So you're really putting in the time and dedication. And you're really stretching your time out as far as what you're going to be able to do. Now, what will end up happening as well is with, ow, with these dudes, you will mostly get, 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 no chemicals for you. That's my wrong. I don't know where she keeps any of this stuff anymore. I'm just, all right, we'll just do water. So with keeping these guys, you have to, come on, 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 come on. You have to understand that you, 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 we're doing 24 hour care here. So they do go up at night and they do go up part of the day and they're still on some of their bottle. So they get their mush food twice a day and they're still getting bottles twice a day. When we first pull them out, it's every three hours through the night, waking up every three hours, feeding these guys their syringes to make sure they get what they need. And then on top of that, just like you saw, they knock things over. When they get a little bit bigger and they could jump, they're gonna start taking stuff off the walls. They'll take your TV off the walls, all the pictures. They'll start knocking all this stuff over. It gets to a point where they're too big to be inside. I'm not saying it's impossible to have one inside for its entire life. I'm saying it would be extremely agitating to a certain point where eventually people give up. And what I see so often is people jump into an impulse buy because it's so damn cute and they're so damn interesting. And so somebody will impulse buy and then they have a great time. They have a wonderful time during this stage of life. One of two things happens. Either A, they realize that it's not gonna work inside, and then the responsible ones will go ahead and get another one, and on top of them being extremely expensive and critically endangered, you can get a permit for them here in Florida, and other states do have them too, but what ends up happening is this. Either they realize that they can't spend the time that's needed, even the people that stay home all day, even the people that are retired, uh, it does become a little bit of a stretch to do all of that. So they'll end up getting another one, which let's just say on the low end of things, you're spending 12 grand for two of these guys, right? And then you think that's the end of the price. That's not. The cage that I have out back for the macaques isn't even done yet, and we're 15 grand into the cage itself. The enclosure here, which we have to stretch out and make a little bit bigger for Maui and Moana, uh, we're gonna put another 20 feet on the other side of that, a little open top, so if they feel like getting rained on, which they won't, uh, they can go and get weathered, but that one has a roof. That thing right there is, is not as big as I would like it to be, but it's a good enclosure, but you're talking about another 7,500 bucks just to build that. And then I have to build it too, because I can't afford to have people come out here and build it. Now I do have friends that'll help, but for the most part, it never works out like that. But at the end of the day, the one of the two things that happens is either A, they realize it's not gonna work inside, they spend the money, they build the enclosure, they have them outside, they still spend the time, 
But then what usually ends up happening is sexual maturity hits and you really have to know what you're doing when that happens. Hormones are changing just like people. Uh, the females, it's a matriarchal society. So those guys are gonna rule the roost. And then on top of that, you really have to know what cues you're looking out for, what you're doing. And you gotta really wanna spend the time because if you don't spend enough time with these guys, this from Maui is during breeding season and he doesn't even do it aggressively. He's a little shit. What he'll do is he'll come in and he'll nuzzle at my feet like he always does because it's a daily activity. So he'll come over and he sits with me and we hang out until she beats him up for her attention. But when they're breeding, he still has this sense of protection. He goes into protection mode and so does she. So during breeding season and while the babies are in there, I still go in but it's a little bit spaced out. I go in there, I do the cleaning and feeding, I kind of ignore them and then I move on. But my little dude will come and nuzzle up and then he just barely beep, just a little tiny ooh, bite, but their teeth are so sharp and then he gets them stuck and he rocks them back and forth. So if I were to panic and I were to try and push him away or tell him no or any of that stuff, the chances are is he would freak out twice as bad and he would really tear me up. And I know it looks like he tore me up, but these are love bites compared to what can happen. I'll send a picture if I can, it's not my picture, I'll see if I can use it, of a girl that had her arm chewed on by a lemur and it was two bites, two teeth, and it literally went probably about an inch and a half into her tricep on both sides where the teeth hit. And that's a panic move where they rip it out of the mouth and they're trying to get out of the cage. For me, uh, if I get bit, I stand there, I watch it, I ignore the situation, I don't pay attention to the behavior that I don't want, I deal with it, and then I move on so that I can keep the relationship with my animal. If I whack him or try and do anything like that or any negative attention towards that, chances are he either A, doesn't like the fact that I reprimanded him, or B, he learns that he can get one over on me and if he wants to annoy me, he can. So I just ignore that stuff, pretend it's okay, and then I walk out and we reset the next day. With my dogs and stuff, there's a bit of correction that we can use with certain animals. There's a bit of correction we can use. And when I say correction, I'm not saying swat the dog, beat the dog or anything like that. But there's certain things that we can do as far as corrective training that we cannot do with the primates, at least in my experience. Everything with these guys is positive reinforcement. It takes time. So if you're not willing to sit with this thing for almost all day long, have it in your bed for about a year and a half until they're old enough to go outside, then you're really not going to have the relationship that you think you're going to have and they can be very dangerous, especially for little kids. This thing could tear this, well not this one, but the adults in there, they could rip a hole in her face. Yeah, they could do you a little joker smile if they wanted to. And uh, you know, they can be dangerous. So they are cute, they are cuddly, but generally what happens most of the time is what I see, people will spend the money, they have the fun while they're this age, by the time they get to a year, they're big, they're annoying, most people say, it's too much for me, I can't deal with this, take them, and then they move on somewhere else. And the problem with that is they get so used to being with that person or whatever it is, and then a lot of times they're bounced around. That's what I don't like to see. It's why we're very picky and choosy on where, these mammals go because we want them to have a good, long lasting life that's going to be full of enrichment, especially because we're in control over what happens in the lives of these animals, the same as we're in control of what happens in the lives of our children until they're 18 years old, they're under our roof and they got to do what we want them to do to try and better their life uh, into adulthood. The difference is, is they never get that. They always have us, so we're in charge of getting them food, we're in charge of getting them water, we're in charge of making sure they're mentally stimulated, we're in charge of the quality of life until that animal passes away. And for these guys, that's a good long time. So it's a commitment and you gotta realize that. So there's a little video and I'm gonna have Eric chop this up. We're gonna see how this turns out. We got mommy and daddy here checking out the babies and look, that's mom right there and I gotta get in there and clean that little cage and mulch it up a bit. But there's mommy and you can see she shows absolutely no interest. You want them back? Huh? You want them back in there? Yeah? No? Not even a little bit, huh? Yeah. Ma Ma uh, Maui's up here, Moana's down here. What are you doing? You don't want them in there either, huh bud? Yeah, they could care less. But hopefully this is a good informational video for you guys. It's a good start, um, especially with Eric. We'll see what he does with the editing here. He's far better at it than I am. I hope you guys enjoy the video.
we're going to continue the Patreon, social media, all that stuff. We're going to really try and bounce it up as much as we possibly can. I know I say that every single time, but I have a little bit of help now. So hopefully that will uh, help things come together a little bit more. All right, tell them, tell them, boom. Huh? Go boom. Boom. Monkey. Boom. Monkey. No more coffee for you monkeys. Nutcases. Hand out of the way. See them little chompers. Those are little combing teeth. It's literally shaped like a like a back scratcher. And what they do is mommy and the babies and themselves, they'll groom themselves up. So oftentimes when you go and do the little scratchy scratch, you get the love noises. And you need a bath because you got food all over you. But usually they'll stop dead in their tracks because this is what mom does when she goes in there with them and she's cleaning them up. But that's, that's how you stop a lemur dead in his trip. Let me get the armpit. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's, oh is that good? Is that good? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, you I want that? Oh, yeah. The belly. Mm. One is hanging off. Mm. One's hanging off your foot. Yeah. All right, and we're done. What are you doing, Biggie Smalls? What are you doing, Biggie Smalls? Can you jump as far as the lemurs can? Yes, Biggie Smalls was introduced. The neighbors had some puppies and I found it quite comical. Um, they just wanted good homes and the kids really wanted their own dog as if their dogs aren't their own, but they want one that pays more attention to them than daddy. And it's working because Biggie Smalls here definitely likes the kids more than more than daddy this time around. So, plus I thought it'd be funny to walk down with a Presa Canario, tiny dog, and, and, and then this thing that we have here. Biggie Smalls, we need to get you a big gold chain, bud. Yeah, I don't know what you're eating there, but... <laughs> yeah, I hear gross. Go back and you're, you see, look at these scraggly little shit. Go back there and get some food. Cocaine is great! Justin, if you could be a lemur, what kind of lemur would you be? I don't remember the exact species, but I will be a lemur that hangs next to the coast and then they use the toxic millipedes to, you know, get a little bit of. It's like a deep for them, keeps the insects off, but then they also get a little bit high from the, you know, from the millipedes. They figured out if they squirted a little bit of toxin in the mouth and they don't hurt the millipedes when they do it, they just, you know, get the little squirt squirt in the mouth and then they're selling down for like four hours on the beach. Just kind of hang out. Yeah, it's midday, it's time to party, bro. Hand me a millipede. That's the one that I would. You would be a millipede sucking lemur. Yes. Google lemur millipede, and I'm sure it'll pop up some very informational videos on that. I'm sure there's probably more than one species that do it, but I know there's one specifically that hangs out next to the coast, considering that all species live in Madagascar. Which for 101 or 106 or 112, it really depends on where you get your information from. I've really tried to nail it down. And I can't for the life of me figure out why they're sawing on a Saturday. But, you know, what it is, is uh, it's too much information, and then you really got to cipher, you know, the code and figure out what's true and what's not. Tell me the scariest lemur story you've got. I don't have scary stories, bro. I mean, I'm sure they would terrify other people, but... Panic is no good in any situation. So even in the scariest situations, the heart rate stays the same. What was the funniest thing that ever happened to you with a lemur? The funniest thing that ever happened? Yeah. Well, if anything specifically funny pops out. Make it up. Uh, there's 
always lots of turds that'll fall on you. You know, you got a good size enclosure and everybody's hanging out above. What people don't know is that ringtail lemurs, they got a nice solid poopies, you know what I mean? So like it's a solid shot, you can pick it up and throw it at somebody. With the rough lemurs, oftentimes it's just, well, I would say all the time, it's just mashed potatoes. So, you know, you get a big juicy, a juicy splash from them, it's not like it just hits your shoulder and rolls off. It's kind of just paints you with whatever they ate the day before. It's interesting too, you could change the colors of those duties. You know, give a little bit of extra sweet potato and you got some nice orange hues to the duties, lots of blueberries, and then you get a nice blue hue. So it really depends on what color you want to paint the floor that, that current day. Nice, nice, nice. I think the funniest thing is watching other people playing the lemur cages back in the day and having them get shit on. Yeah, there we go.